Welcome to Everything STEAM. I'm your host, Sam Stanford. As a physicist and structural engineer with Jacobs Engineering, I've made many connections with some bright individuals who are either working, studying, or self-taught and passionate about our particular topics of discussion. This episode takes us way out of the solar system to places that are really far away. Today, my guests and I are discussing exoplanets. We will touch on the key points of how they are found, what they consist of, and the possibility of life on other planets. And then towards the latter portion of this shindig, we will touch on both space policy and outreach. To help me broadcast all of this cool information, I went back to Arizona State University and found one of Skylar Grayson's colleagues. Just to jog your memory, Skylar was my guest for the Galactic Evolution episode. If you haven't heard that episode, you should definitely put that in your queue. But without further delay, let me introduce Lindsay Weiser. Lindsay grew up in the California Bay Area before moving to Maryland for her undergraduate degree at Johns Hopkins University. She started in mechanical engineering and after an internship at the Space Telescope Science Institute, she added a second major in Earth and Planetary Science. Throughout her undergrad, she also interned at the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum, Aerospace Industries Association, and NASA headquarters. She helped lead a university chapter of SEDS, or the Students for the Exploration and Development of Space, in a design-build fly club. It's really cool because this club would build remote-controlled airplanes for a yearly competition. And in 2019, she was awarded the Brooks Owens Fellowship for Gender Minorities in Aerospace. And in 2020, Lindsay started her PhD at Arizona State University. She studies the compositions and climates of exoplanet atmospheres and works with data from the Hubble Space Telescope, the Spitzer Space Telescope, and the newly launched James Webb Space Telescope. On top of her research, Lindsay thinks a lot about space and science policy. She has written about planetary protection, international space governance, tracking output from space missions, and much more. She leads the U.S. Task Force for Space Policy and Advocacy through the Space Generation Advisory Council, or SGAC, which is a global network of young professionals. So, now that you've been introduced to my guest star and the topic of this podcast, we're going to head into the first segment where we will dive into the science of exoplanets. Enjoy. Lindsay, welcome to the podcast. How are you doing? I'm good. Thanks for having me. I'm excited. Yeah, I'm actually, I was really surprised. So Lindsay and I met at a, not like a panel discussion, but it was a presentation based on some uh, JWST images. Uh, was it one of your professors at ASU that was was holding that, that, that like, um, I don't know, public conference? Uh, no, so the, the department that I am in, uh, it's at Arizona State University. Uh, I'm in the School of Earth and Space Exploration. They put on a, some open houses and stuff throughout throughout the year each year, and so this was put together by that. And uh, they wanted somebody to talk about their experiences working with JWST from an exoplanet perspective, and I'm one of the people at ASU doing that, so I was asked to help out. That's awesome. Yeah, and uh, exoplanets is just a really fun word, and I'm sure it captures a lot of wonderful imagination of both the scientific and also the very interesting social perspective that we're probably not going to get into. So if you think that we're going to just talk aliens the whole time, you might want to find a different podcast. But um, I think we should start out just prefacing in that manner. I think we should start out with just the really basic, simple question, Lindsay, of what is an exoplanet? What do we consider an exoplanet? Yeah, so an exoplanet is essentially a planet that orbits a star that isn't our sun. And so I'm thinking about planets that are a long ways away, and we can't go to them at this point, but we can observe them, and there are thousands of them that we've already confirmed to be out there, and many, many more beyond that. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, what is like, so I, I, know, I know you just said that like we can't get there, right? Uh, just to put in perspective, um, man, even like with the fastest uh, shuttles that we have, I, I we would take like hundreds, maybe th- thousands of years to, to get yeah. to anything that's close to us. Yeah, so I actually don't know, but um, from my understanding, the closest exoplanet is a few light years away. Right. So that's a long ways. That's a long ways. Right, right. And if, uh, if you're not familiar, that's how far 
light travels within a year at, you know, <laughs> uh, 2.998 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. So <laughs> we're not that fast yet <laughs> or maybe yeah. ever. But um, yeah, so kind of curious because this is uh, something that it, I guess is like more contested in the scientific community um, on the definition of exoplanets. Because we talked a little bit offset or before this whole recording happened was that rogue planets aren't tech. Like some people don't like it being involved in exoplanets. Some do. I mean, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, yeah. So that's a that's a good question. Um, so I guess for context, uh, the astronomy community doesn't always agree on definitions of things. A lot of people are familiar with the debate of whether or not Pluto is a planet. And so this is similar. There are bodies that are like planet size, maybe really, really big planet size that are just out on their own and they're not orbiting a star. Um, and there's some debate over whether or not that counts as an exoplanet. Um, I think officially now it's been proposed that that's like a sub brown dwarf. So a sub star in some way rather than a planet. But I don't know. I would argue that it's still a planet if it's the size of a planet. Yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't argue it to be more star like, but yeah, that's very interesting. <laughs> uh, yeah. And uh, the the rogue really fits. It's kind of a, uh, a beautiful sci-fi way to put that you know it's a, a planet or body that's been kicked out of a solar system over time like through its formation and you know it, it it's kind of funny and we'll probably we might touch on this uh, as we go through this episode is solar systems aren't that beautiful in steady state they can be quite chaotic and over billions of years you can end up losing lots of mass and having a lot of rogue planets or just having rogue planets come into your own solar system. There's always that possibility. And uh, I think it's more beautiful that it's chaotic. But moving on, uh, I'm curious, how do we detect these exoplanets? Because I'm sure that's really hard being that far away and that small. So yeah, curious. yeah. So it is definitely tricky. Um, even though, you know, logically, it doesn't seem that surprising that there would be planets around other stars if there's planets around our star we didn't actually discover any exoplanets until the 90s so mm. it's not been very long and so uh, there are a few different ways we can detect them um, one of the most common ways that we hear about is the transit method so essentially if you are looking at a star and there's a planet orbiting that star, if the planet orbits and passes in front of the star, so it passes between your field of view and the star, then the light will just dim a little bit. And so you'll see the star flicker dimmer and then brighter again. Okay. Um, and so that's one way we can detect that something is going around it if that's happening at regular intervals. Say the planet orbits once every three weeks. If you see a dimming every three weeks, you know that uh, there was a planet there. There's also ways to just stare at stars for a really long time. And really big planets will have a gravitational effect on their star. And so the star will actually wiggle a little bit as well. Um, and we can detect that wiggling of a star to detect that there's a planet there. Other methods are you can try to really block, you can try to block out starlight uh, using something called a coronagraph, which is essentially like putting your thumb in front of a really bright spot to be able to see the stuff around it better. Um, and you can use that to more directly actually image the light coming from a planet. Um, so, yeah, there are a number of different ways we do it. All of them require uh, high sensitivity but we're now able to do it pretty well. So that uh, that second method that you talked about, it kind of seems like uh, almost a Doppler effect where you have like a dance in the sky, you know, with the mm -hmm. star and whatever is revolving around it. And just also we have to take into account the complexity or the possibility of complexity in these star systems because you're going to have more than just one body rotating around the star. So 
essentially to be able to detect something that's, you know, just have a, a system that has more than just one rotating body. You have to stare at that star for a long time and figure out its intervals. It's so you can understand how many bodies potentially are there. And um, you can also use the either the first method or the second method. You can pay attention to the Doppler effect, uh, which is just the wobbling, or you can look at its luminosity, how much, you know, how much dimmer the star gets as these bodies rotate in front of it. It is simple, but it can also be complex and time consuming. Yeah, I mean, like like you were hinting at, you know, when you have multiple planets around a star, uh, it becomes a little bit more complicated for all these methods because, you know, if you see a star, if you see some sort of transit happening, there's a dimming of the star and then it happens again a week later, but then it doesn't happen for, say, a few months that's no longer a regular interval. And that could be because there's actually multiple planets doing the transiting with different orbital periods. So yeah, it, it could be a fun puzzle for some of those more complex systems. Definitely. So look, let's talk about the applied portion of this. What are you using to be able to look at the luminosity or the Doppler effect, the wobble of a star? I'm curious. Yeah, so th to look at exoplanets, um, we use space telescopes, ground-based telescopes, um, kind of the whole gamut of telescopes. Um, but ones that people may be most familiar with are the Hubble Space Telescope, uh, the Spitzer Space Telescope, now JWST. Mm -hmm. And then there have been some more dedicated programs specifically for detecting exoplanets. So uh, Kepler, for example, or, for example, had the K2 mission, which is essentially they tacked on an extra number of years after Kepler's, Kepler's primary mission to just kind of dedicate time to searching for exoplanets. Nice. Uh, and TESS, TESS is a smaller uh, mission than these big telescopes that we build, but it's also intended to just do a sweep of the sky and I uh, detect a bunch of planets that then we can follow up with other more specific instruments. So interesting. So yeah. uh, just for my curiosity, maybe other people are wondering too, what portion of the EM spectrum are we taking advantage of whenever we're, you know, looking for these exoplanets? Yeah, so it can be all over, but I would say that um, a lot of the area we're looking at for exoplanets is going to be the near infrared. Interesting. Uh, do you mind me asking why it is the near infrared? So there are some really cool features there. Some really important molecules have features in those wavelength ranges that are uh, interesting to detect. So things like water, um, methane, etc. Uh, so there's just a lot of features there. Um, it's also where we can start to see the planets more brightly um, mm -hmm. because we're trying to separate the planet's light from the stellar light. Um, and yep. in shorter wavelengths, sometimes it's harder to separate out. So in the near infrared is where planets themselves become especially bright. Yeah, that makes sense. And especially, I mean, it's also probably a play on what type of star you're really dealing with too. Um, I guess one more, one more question before we roll in. This is me like adding questions. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, no worries. We talked about how we can find these planets, right? These exoplanets. But we didn't cover like maybe how we detect their their size and their density. I don't know. I don't think we have that slated for any of the other segments. So I'm just thought I'd add it on here. Do you have anything for us there? Yeah. So, I mean, some of that will be very... Some of that comes from very similar methods. So if we are seeing a star wiggling, for example, what we can measure the gravitational effect that the mm -hmm. planet is having on the star and then can sort of infer how massive the planet must be. Yeah. So it's it's a lot of kind of similar methods to before. But yeah, using using those, using that wiggling to think about the mass, using the length between transits to think about orbits yeah 
And how big is the dip in light? That can tell you a bit about the radius of the planet. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's a lot of very similar methods, just picking out pieces of them. Yeah. And then you can get like some cool information, like the density and stuff like that. Yeah. That mm-hmm. makes a bunch of sense. So how many have we found so far? I, I, my understanding is we've been only doing this since the nineties. So mm-hmm. curious how many we've seen. Yeah. So, so far we have confirmed over 5,000 exoplanets. Nice. Uh, there are thousands more that have are kind of preliminary. They're not confirmed yet, but could possibly be detections with further with more follow up. Mm-hmm. And you know, I don't know exactly how many there are out there, but it's a huge number. Uh, we're certainly at the point where we think that most stars probably have planets, or at least a lot of them do. Uh, so there's tons out there, but there are about five thousand that haven't been officially confirmed. I think it's it's fair to to make that statement now with all of the increasing evidence. And I mean, with a galaxy that has an approximate 100 billion stars, just imagine how many planets you have in, in one galaxy with yeah. a universe filled with, with galaxies, you know, in abundance. So that's very mm-hmm. exciting. And uh, I think it's really interesting, and we'll talk about it in segment two, just how they form as... as you know, in, in uh, how they form in different ways is pretty cool. So I guess that would lead into what I want to talk about next before we run into our first commercial break is how the exoplanets that we're seeing, all these thousands of exoplanets that we've declared as exoplanets, how are they comparing to the ones in our solar system? Yeah, a lot of the planets we're seeing are super different um, from anything in our solar system, and a lot of them aren't. Right. So um, things like uh, ocean worlds, ice giants, we found those in abundance. There are a lot of those out there. Um, And we do have planets like that in our solar system. Um, But we've also found planets that are super unique. So one type of planet that has been heavily studied um, in the past past decades has been hot Jupiters. Mm -hmm. And so those are Jupiter-sized planets, maybe a little smaller, maybe bigger, um, but they're really close to their star, and so they're really hot, versus our Jupiter, who, which is super far out and really cold. Um, so something like a hot Jupiter, that doesn't exist in our system at all. And so, yeah, there's a whole, there's a whole mix. There's planets that are like ones we see, and there are planets that are absolutely nothing like what we see. Um, so it's it's fun to... Think about how unique we might be. Yeah, you know, even it, it's 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 very interesting because I've read on some some systems that have, like, their nearest planet is like three million kilometers, whereas like Mercury is like fifty five million kilometers, and it's and it's just revolving around its star at such a insane speed, <laughs> like a few <laughs> days. <laughs> It's, yeah. oh, it's 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 fascinating uh, how variable the solar systems could be. It, and mm-hmm. we haven't even talked about like the possibility, honestly, like it's very probable to have like a binary star system. And that's a whole different dynamic. Yeah, that's not uncommon. There are binary star systems and there are planets around them. So, yeah, that's that's not something that that's not something that we've never seen. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, just even the progression of Jupiter-like planets, like from my understanding, it's more probabilistic to have a Jupiter move in inward towards a star over time rather than kind of like what Jupiter is doing in our solar system. And it's almost like it's like being tugged by Saturn to stay away from from the inner the inner circle. Yeah, so hot Jupiters are um, a pretty small percentage of planets we found so far, um, but we have huge biases and detections and True. such, and so it's hard for us really to know uh, necessarily what the most common methods are yet, but, but it's super interesting to think about. And as we discover more and more, we are beginning to complete those statistics a bit more, so. That's true, yeah, because the more data that we get, the more we'll understand how solar systems form mm-hmm. and what what things mean. It's a good point. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I think we're going to jump into our first commercial break. And then when we come back, we're going to talk more about the recent developments 
in the exoplanet realm of, of planetary science. So stick around. We're back. This is segment two, and we're going to talk about the, the recent developments, however that recent may be. And I guess I'll start out with the, the quick question of, well, maybe not even quick. This might be an interesting talk. Uh, why, why do we study the atmospheres of these exoplanets? Yeah, so when we're observing these planets, one of the big things that um, I and a lot of people care about and are looking for um, is their atmosphere specifically. And so we are uh, thinking about what are their atmospheres made of? Um, what sort of dynamics might be going on in them? Are there clouds? Are there currents? The kind of the big questions we're trying to answer are, um, one, how do planets form? So what a planet is made of today uh, could, could be a product of its formation history, where it formed, how it migrated. And so using composition to inform formation uh, and then climate uh, helps us understand ongoing processes in the atmosphere that can influence all sorts of things. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. There's a wide variability of what is what is truly possible because you know it seems for the layperson it seems alien like to have different atmospheres that have different compositions, different atmospheric pressures, different temperatures from both ends of the spectrum from hot to cold and it's it's quite fascinating i was gonna say yeah if we all if we all kind of remember maybe a chemistry class we took forever ago uh <laughs> there are different molecules that can exist at different temperatures and pressures and so um even a planet that may have similar atomic composition uh, may have different molecules forming its atmosphere depending on uh, the conditions and so you really can end up with a with a wide range of possibilities yeah definitely and and even the dynamics of say like if a if a planet's like in how oh, what is what is it called whenever it's in a in a lock with like the the star where you have like a hot and a cold side yeah so it's tidal locking yeah tidal lock yeah gotcha yeah, there you go yeah yeah which... so that's essentially when the planet uh, is maybe close to its star and the the mass is strong, the gravity is strong, and so it actually prevents the planet from rotating. And so you have a permanent day side and a permanent night side. Very interesting. It makes a very, very interesting dynamic at the at the boundary of that hot and cold uh, transition. <laughs> <laughs> it really does. It really does. So you can have a day side where there's no clouds, it's crazy hot, and then a night side that maybe has a bunch of clouds because it's way colder and you're getting molecules condensing out of the atmosphere as at that transition point between day and night. Yeah, that's really fascinating. So how are we studying these atmospheres? What are we using? Yeah, so we're using a lot of these big telescopes, ground and space-based, but we look at them in a number of different ways. So I mentioned before the transit method which we can use to detect a dip in starlight. But um, we can separate out wavelengths and detect you know, different depths, so different amount of light being blocked out at different wavelengths. Um, and that could indicate an atmosphere. So if you think of it like holding up a piece of paper in front of a light bulb, some light will make it through and some light won't. Um, and atmospheres are similar. Some light doesn't make it through the atmosphere and some does. And so if we split that up by wavelength, we can start to infer what the atmosphere might be made of based on what light gets blocked and what light doesn't. So that's, that's one way with the transit method. Um, there's also eclipse, which is when a planet was just behind its star, but emerges from behind its star. And in that case, you're looking at the day side of the planet. So you can separate out the starlight and just extract the daylight of the planet. And that's that's another way that we can we can get light specifically from the planet as opposed to the star. Mm, and if you think about it on a time lapse, you can kind of figure out how fast 
things are moving within the atmosphere, like how fast those currents are, right? Um, so a lot of what we're thinking about is like, for example, you have a day side temperature compared to a night side temperature. So therefore how much circulation must be occurring mm -hmm. or you can look at the planet throughout its orbit. So you can look at the planet from full day side to partial day side to full night side um, and trying to get kind of all those angles of the planet and uh, detect the light coming off of it um, helps us understand uh, the temperatures and based on what molecules are present, you can start to think about how those molecules got there, um, what temperatures it requires. That's really interesting. Now, I am kind of curious I know I'm sure there's there's a long list and, you know, uh, well, we've already established there's a long list. So I'm curious, what are some examples and maybe some of your, I guess, favorite examples of exoplanets? Oh, boy. Um, well, <laughs> I'll give you the uh, scientist answer, because what I do is I create I essentially create fake planets. I use code and I make a fake planet and I compare yeah. it to real ones, to data from real ones. Um, and based on how well my model does in comparison to the data, I could think about what that could mean for the planet. But so the scientist answer or the modeler answer is all my favorites are the ones that fit my models the best, <laughs> because those are the <laughs> ones that I feel like I might have a close handle on. But planets that I think uh, a lot of people, especially outside of the exoplanet community, are especially interested in are planets like the Trappist system. So for people who know nothing else about exoplanets, maybe they've heard of the Trappist system. Um, that one's super interesting because um, it's actually a much cooler star. And so all the planets in that system are much closer to their star than they are um, in our solar system. Um, but still three of those planets, or one to three of those planets are potentially within a reasonable temperature range to maybe have some similarities to Earth. And yeah, that's just a really cool system because there's a lot of planets in it. Um, we haven't observed that many systems where we can detect so many planets. And it has smaller rocky planets, whereas a lot of exoplanets that we've spent a lot of time digging deep into are the large gassy planets because those are the ones that are easier for us to observe yeah. because they're bigger and they have a larger <laughs> right. effect. So it's easier to get good data and to start to understand those ones. So yeah, people like the rocky planets. I think they're very cool, um, but <laughs> it'll take better data to be able to learn a whole lot about them. Honestly, I do think the really big planets, though they may not have life on them like we think of it, I think they're really, really interesting because they have a really big gravitational impact on their planetary systems. So even if all we cared about are the little rocky ones, we need to understand the large ones to understand how mm -hmm. those systems work <laughs> at all, right? Yeah. And there's some super weird things that can happen in these atmospheres. Like you can get molecules existing that don't exist anywhere else. Um, and so I think that that is really cool. In the era of JWST, I will say that the planets I'm most excited about are ocean world planets because yeah. we've spent a lot of time looking at large gas giants uh, with Hubble, Spitzer, ground-based mm -hmm. telescopes, et cetera. Um, and we've, we've started to get a little bit of a handle on them in, in some ways and some ways not. Um, but with JWST, with that bigger telescope, we'll be able to start to get better data on a slightly smaller population of ocean worlds. And I think that that will be really cool. Yeah, that's very, that's, you know, it's, it's very exciting. I, I guess it, it's kind of been like hinted at um, throughout the episode, especially now in this segment, because we've talked about the variance of, of stars, right? How um, important is the the variance of stars to determining exoplanets uh, between their size, brightness, et cetera? Just curious. Yeah, so we actually don't know a whole lot about that. Uh, nice. But there are people who 
uh, are definitely researching this. There are people who are really excited about the idea of M dwarfs because maybe they could have more rocky, maybe Earth like planets around them, but they're also super active because uh, they just, th- this is a class of star that is known for being um, particularly active. Mm. Active stars may inhibit a habitable planet or a stable planet because Mm -hmm. you're getting things like flares or sunspots or whatever. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. so, yeah, the star certainly has a huge effect, but I would say that that is, you know, that's something that we're still understanding is how important the star is for the eventual planets that form around them. Wouldn't also the, the age or the progression of the system be important as well? Another, just another parameter that needs to be looked at. Yeah, yeah. As as planetary systems evolve, uh, they change. So, you know, the the initial the the idea for how we think planets likely form is that when a star forms, uh, you end up with this left leftover material around the star called the protoplanetary disk, um, and then material within that disk uh, over time essentially snowballs to form larger materials and you start to get planets and so based on the stellar composition that affects what material is even available to form planets Mm -hmm. so that's why understanding the composition of planets can tell us something about where it formed and planets that form further away from their star uh, maybe that material is colder and so you have more ices different materials are in solid and gas form. And so that affects what those planets are made of versus a planet mm-hmm. that forms maybe closer to the star further in the disk and you have more gas form material. And then over time, those planets can migrate as well. And so you could have a planet that formed really far out in the super cold regions and then migrated further inwards and maybe did or didn't collect additional material as it was going in. And so that is a, it's a whole complex system of how these planets could form. And um, really, we, we're not we're not entirely sure what the most common methods are yet. Um, and we're still trying to figure out how much we can really say about these formation pathways from exoplanet observations. Yeah, yeah, it makes, makes a lot of sense. I mean, if you think about it just on a real, I don't know, maybe a top-down view, there's it seems very chaotic but there can be some parameters that we can pluck out and say well this happens in most cases but these parameters are extremely chaotic and it's just based on you know how how things collide how things move um composition the cool thing about the kind of the studying the star we can kind of understand the composition of of well the the outcomes of the of the planets that rotate around them. For sure. No, I mean, understanding the star is a really key component to exoplanet research that often isn't isn't talked about quite as much because you don't get the big headline of like, oh, we found an Earth like rocky planet. But uh, no, definitely understanding the star is a is a super key component. And there are a lot of planetary formation models, you know, for, that maybe started from our solar system and ideas we had from our solar system that we can now try to apply to exoplanetary systems. But yeah, for people who are interested in planetary formation and maybe want to go Google something on their own time, Google the core accretion model, because that is, uh, you know, what basically the leading idea for how planets form, but still figuring out how we apply that to different systems in different contexts. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I'll make sure to throw a link somewhere mm-hmm. so that people can can access that. But yeah, I, I guess a couple more questions and then we'll roll into to break just because I'm sure some people are, are curious. One term that, that gets thrown out a lot, especially with our solar system, is the Goldilocks zone. And mm-hmm. I just, first of all, I want to get your, your, your thoughts on that. And then I don't know, maybe how accurate that is how do you how do you feel about the goldilocks zone yeah no good question people when we talk about exoplanets everyone wants to talk about aliens talk about life (laughs) um and that is 
totally valid. Um, mm-hmm. I'm not in it for the aliens, but I do think the aliens are cool. Um, and I do care a lot about what exoplanets can tell us about how unique our planet is. So mm-hmm. totally valid to ask about aliens and the Goldilocks zone, sometimes also referred to as the habitable zone. The idea is that uh, there is a region, there's a, there's an area of radii around a star in which the temperatures are just right to be able to have liquid water on the surface, um, which we're pretty sure is required for life like on Earth. But there are a lot of variables that go into that that are <laughs> really <laughs> complex to understand, right? I mean, yeah. uh, one, there can be life that exists that's not like ours. Mm -hmm. Um, there could be, uh, planets with and without atmospheres are going to have different temperatures on their surface. So, you know, you look at Mars, which is not that its radius is not super indifferent to, to earth's, but it's lost a lot of its atmosphere. So the temperature on the surface is super different and Venus has this crazy thick atmosphere um, and so we know that the the uh, atmosphere of the planet has a huge impact on things as well. You can also think about potential life or building blocks of life um, on things like ocean worlds, which are in the outer solar system, um, which are certainly not within a habitable zone of our system. <laughs> yeah. But there are still people who think, oh, we could maybe look for building blocks of life in those areas. So I think that it is a, I think that thinking about what the habitable zone could be uh, is definitely a worthwhile question, um, but it is far more complex than at these radii, you're going to have a planet that has an ocean and is like earth and you'll find life there. Like that's, it's not that simple, but Mm -mm. It is a worthwhile question to think about what is required for life. Yeah, most definitely. Yeah, because, I mean, you hit the nail on the head. I mean, Earth, our best evidence has suggested is that life started in the ocean and uh, or in water. Sorry, just in water around mm-hmm. hydrothermal vents. Um, and it's, you know, it doesn't have to be that way. What I like to say is that we have one data point. Right. We have Earth and we <laughs> yeah. know that there's life here, <laughs> Yep. but we don't really know what that means for anywhere else. Um, we don't, you know, with one data point, we don't know how unique we are. We don't know really anything. So, um, yeah, I think that, you know, we know that life is possible on a planet like Earth. So if we wanted to look for life looking for other planets like Earth makes sense. That's a way to narrow down our search. Mm -hmm. Um, But I I don't think that it is reasonable to assume that with our one data point, we know what all life must look like and we know where to look at all times. Yeah. Like I said, with with hundreds of billions of stars, I mean, it just, (laughs) the probabilities aren't aligning there. (laughs) But, and um, even and even if we did find a planet that had life, an exoplanet with life, you know, at this stage, how would we confirm that? I don't think we could, really. I mean, we can look for what people call biosignatures that maybe mm-hmm. we think could be produced by life, but we can't go there. We can't confirm it. We don't know that it's not some geological process that's causing a biosignature. And so yeah, searching for life, super worthwhile endeavor, um, fascinating thing to think about. But realistically, I think the part that I'm especially interested in is just understanding the complexities of systems around the galaxy and understanding how unique our system is and using that to maybe extrapolate to what else could there be out there. Yeah. That's fair. There's there's different ways that that people use for motivation in in these studies mm-hmm. for sure. Um, additionally, I, I guess I just want to quickly explain biosignatures before we we wrap up this segment because we name dropped it but didn't really say like what what they are or what they could be. And you can expand on this. Um, but for for the example of Earth, a great 
biosignature for Earth is the amount of oxygen in our atmosphere, right? Because it's it's obviously based on photosynthesis and and the balance of of respiration that that shows a good biosignature. The interesting thing about that is is on Earth, if you were to look at Earth like 600 million years ago, you wouldn't have had even a percent of the amount that we have today. I mean, we have 20%. And it took three and a half billion years, right, until we could actually get 1%, not even 1% of oxygen. Today, we have 20%. So um, measuring, measuring oxygen is a good one. Measuring methane is a good one carbon dioxide, stuff like that. And maybe, Lindsay, you can weigh in on that as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so there are a lot of different hypotheses about what what would we look for? What has the highest probability of being life and not something else? Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but these are really hard questions because there are, of course, yeah. probably processes that we haven't thought of that could be happening. And, yeah. you know, we, fee we see things like, co2 and methane and exoplanet atmospheres that's not those are things that we could expect to see on planets that maybe are way too hot or not in the True. right region or whatever for life and so mm -hmm. these molecules have ways of existing without they have ways of existing without it being life and so yeah yep. thinking of thinking about that probability uh, is definitely interesting yeah yeah you you won't know Till you really show up <laughs> i don't know all these are fun thought experiments i think yeah. my favorite you know something that i've been thinking a lot about which i hinted at was so interestingly we actually have no like consensus on what life is we don't even know like, like there's no definition for life like mm -hmm. no one no no one's agreed on whether or not a virus counts as life that's example. true um and so when we're searching for life it's absolutely hilarious to mm -hmm. me that like we don't know what it is, one. <laughs> and because we don't know what it is, we don't know what it requires, two. <laughs> and because we don't know what it requires, we don't know what to look for, <laughs> three. And then even if we did find it, because we've never answered the first three questions, everyone would disagree on whether or not we found it. So like, That's even fair. if we found life on an exoplanet, I'm sure that there will be tons of people in the community arguing that how oh, it could just be a volcano that spewed chemicals into the atmosphere like <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's just that's true thing. i mean that's that's a good thing about science like i mean you want people to poke holes in your um mm -hmm. in your hypotheses so yeah. i totally get that but then that also stops the progression of of i guess declaring whether it is life or not yeah <laughs> yeah no yep. i get that a lot of people like to talk about the whole carbon versus silicon based life but um the evidence of silicon versus carbon is is hard to prove because i mean while they are quite similar on the periodic table they behave differently in environments silicon based uh, molecules look like the same as as carbon-based molecules will will dissolve in water and mm -hmm. if we think you know life is more probabilistic to start in you know around hydrothermal vents in water <laughs> yeah that's not that's not gonna work so is it more yeah. likely it for it to be a different composition or atmospheric life or terrestrial life that doesn't have mm -hmm. water i don't know yeah like, yeah how do you determine did you, that? Did you hear about all the like Venus phosphine craziness earlier the, in the year? The Venus phosphine? No. So a group of scientists found traces of phosphine in the Venus atmosphere. Okay. And they couldn't think of any possible any any possible like geological anything that would have created it. And so they basically declared like the only way that we can think of that this phosphine would exist is that it's a product of life. It's a byproduct of life that exists. Um, and within like a week, people reanalyzed the data and showed that this phosphine spectral feature was like absolutely tiny and probably not there. And like <laughs> so quickly, 
almost the entire community was like, one, we cannot confirm there's phosphine, but even if there is, there's there are geological things that can make it. Like it's such a small mm. amount that it's not like you can't show that it's consistent consistently there even so it was just this huge debacle where they because it was supposed to be like a big announcement they had a whole event there was like this big press release it was absolutely huge it was like all over the news and then just almost immediately all the scientists read it and they were like this is no you, you didn't know this is not you did not find phosphine and even if you did <laughs> Yeah, um, that's definitely why you need uh, consensus. Yeah, but it's super interesting because there are still a handful of scientists in that original research team will stand by it till the day that they die. That there is phosphine and there was probably life on Venus or something. Hmm. And then there's plenty of people in the group who have come out and said, like, no, we acknowledge, like, we've saw, we saw the reanalysis of the data and we now agree that it's not a conclusive <laughs> result so yeah i don't know it's just it was a super fascinating yeah case study and <laughs> the scientific process and <laughs> human consensus <laughs> <laughs> but yeah okay so i think that's enough um we don't want to talk anymore about aliens <laughs> so <laughs> uh when we come back we're going to talk about space policy and outreach so stick around this is the last segment for the exoplanet episode. Uh, we're going to talk about space policy and outreach. So a lot of people in the science community community understand this, the answer to, I'm sure, the question that I'm about to pose. Lindsay, why, why do we study space? <laughs> it's, it seems so like, uh, it's so weird to ask that question, but uh, for some reason, we still have a lovely budget debate in terms of space science. So please tell me why why we study space. Yeah, I think there are a lot of different reasons for why people study space. So uh, I certainly cannot speak for everybody. Um, but there, there are a number of reasons that I've kind of tossed around <laughs> throughout <laughs> my life for why why I do this and why I love it. I think the, the first answer that I had was, to me, it's just, we live on one planet, um, and that planet is super valuable. You know, there's not a planet B, we need to protect it. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a whole universe out there. And to me, it was just so crazy that we didn't, I didn't learn about space that much in school. I didn't, you know, I maybe learned <laughs> what the planets were, but beyond that, there wasn't a whole lot. Um, and so I just thought like the whole universe is out there. We gotta be trying to understand that. <laughs> and I think understand, understanding space or studying space really helps put our own planet into perspective. It helps us realize how unique our planet is. I'm looking at exoplanets all day where, you know, it's, 200 degrees kelvin <laughs> compared to our planet and so i think it really puts into perspective like how unique and special our planet is mm -hmm. um and i also think that it's a really it's it's a really cool community of people who have dedicated themselves to researching space there are a lot of uh there are a lot of issues and topics and things uh in the U.S. especially, that have become especially partisan. Um, and space is one of those areas where, you know, there's a, there, there is bipartisan support for exploring space. And there are people who maybe disagree on almost everything, but can <laughs> talk about space and get excited about the science or some aspect of it. So I, I think that space has, has, has the powerful potential for putting people in the same room and initiating conversations that maybe wouldn't have happened. And then of course, there's the classic answer that a lot of scientists will give, which is space inspires the young That's generation. Great. There's pretty pictures. Children can look at a picture and get excited about science or art or whatever, whatever mm -hmm. it is that they're inspired to do. So I think that's an answer as well, but above all else, I think it's interesting. 
there are enough people in this world that find it interesting yep. uh, that it's worthwhile to keep doing. Definitely. Additionally, um, with knowing and understanding other things in the cosmos, we can better understand how to take care of it or respect our own planet. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it, there are so many stories, right, of astronauts who went to space, saw Earth from space and realized how special yeah. it was and came back and declared themselves environmentalists. So, yeah, <laughs> there, there are a ton of those. There are a ton of those cheesy stories out there as well. It's cheesy, but it's also legit. I mean, whenever the Apollo missions, you know, whenever they went up into space and the first some of the first photographs of of the Earth uh, inspired the the birth of the EPA in 1970, just one year after that. So, I mean, it has profound effects. Uh, additionally, I mean, the more cutesy philosophical thing that you could say is that we are a way for the universe to know itself. So it's almost intrinsic that we are curious about what goes on on this planet and outside of this planet. So, yep, that is a fun philosophical route that um, quite a few people have taken as well. You know, we're part of the universe and we're that part of the universe that is able to discover the universe. So, yeah, that is that is a fun philosophical discussion, too. Absolutely. Yeah. So. Okay, how does space studying space benefit us not only on a philosophical manner, but I guess we could just address it anthropologically. How do you think that it benefits us like us humans, like outside of just understanding or, or knowing something? I think that one of the things that we're doing as humans is building our understanding of the universe, and that's enough right i mean i think that i think that it's it's enough to be curious and to explore science and try to understand it uh, there are certainly um aspects of the space community that are thinking about you know whether or not we could colonize mars and expand <laughs> outwards and all that kind of stuff um but I mean, I, I don't, I don't, I'm not in space for that. I don't think that it makes sense to colonize Mars. I think if anything, it makes sense to fix our own planet and, and uh, yeah. keep Mars for the science for now. <laughs> when we first started this podcast, we had like a, uh, it was a joke like at first, cause like obviously the word colonization is bad, right? So mm -hmm. we said Mars colonization, good or waste. And we just like debated and my, like my take out of that you know, because from the engineering perspective, like it's exciting, right? And there's new innovation that comes out of it. But um, the more that I looked into an understanding Mars, the more I was like, yo, you that's I don't think you couldn't pay me to to be there. I, I love this planet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and and you're right. I should not have said colonize Mars. I should have said settle or no, nah, yeah. Nah, yeah, I get whatever. You. Mm -hmm. Because yes, that's definitely a valid point. Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, and, and just in that manner, um, we also are looking at like expanding to the moon and stuff like that. It has its merit, um, I think so, but it also puts um, humans at, at risk, at great risk. Um, mm -hmm. Radiation, different things like that, that that come up. Not even just, I mean, just even factoring in gra uh, gravity, gravitational yeah. effects on how humans have evolved to be on Earth and used to our atmospheric pressure and mm -hmm. it's it's just a, a whole different ball game and i was gonna say you know and we, if we bring it back to our planet right i mean space has huge benefits for people when we're talking about satellites and orbit mm -hmm. and communication imaging mm -hmm. all sorts of things that we can do from space that just we can't we haven't done from um, with just earth alone right like we need satellites for all sorts of things like gps and communication and so that is one thing that i think is maybe often overlooked is how critical space and satellites are for everyday life definitely um i do joke that like the person who figures out how to appropriately clear space junk <laughs> is going to be the next <laughs> the the They'll, they'll be a billionaire because there's mm -hmm. a lot of space junk going on up there. I know we're talking, we, we've, we talked a little bit about policy and 
although we don't get very, um, we're not getting political. We just want to talk about policy here. So I know that you do some work in policy. So do you want to tell us a little bit about what you're working on? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, like you said, I, I, you know, we're not here to really talk about political things. We're here to talk about exoplanets. Um, but I do think that it is space policy is a really interesting um, area that is being developed and needs to be developed because activity in space is still relatively young. And there are a lot of unknowns about what laws and policies apply. And so I would encourage people to explore it a bit more. I, I do a couple things. One is I, uh, I help lead the U.S. task force, um, which is part of the Space Generation Advisory Council, SGAC, um, and they have this policy and advocacy platform. So we're part of that. Um, and essentially what we do is try to amplify the perspective of young people in the space industry who you amplify their perspectives on space policy and help to encourage changes or developments. And so that's um, mm -hmm. one group that I work with that I think is super awesome. And SJC as a whole is really awesome um, and worth looking up. Um, and then I also work a little bit on, on the side of my PhD. I work a little bit at ASU on uh, space governance and international space governance and how do we kind of reach an international system of laws and agreements um, for this ever evolving <laughs> yeah. area. So. Yeah, that's a good point that, that um, it is obviously international and it takes a lot of, a lot of collaboration and that's why I have, you know, heaps of respect for, you know, the space community because mm -hmm. I mean, there has to be that collaboration, like in, and, and honestly, yeah. like with these space agencies and stuff like that, even just through studies and research, it, it's just mm -hmm. amazing. And it, it's, it's wonderful to see, uh, people of all different backgrounds working together to solve problems. It's, it's, and yeah. you don't really see that in, in well, other fields. Well, that's one thing I love about space is it's not and borders yeah. right i mean if you have a satellite in space it is orbiting and it's crossing over all sorts of countries and the satellite doesn't see that the satellite sees i am falling in space around this rock so <laughs> <laughs> i think it's obviously gonna need to be an international effort to understand the rules that apply um and that's one of my favorite things about working in space and working on missions like JWST that are international collaborations. You know, I'm working yeah. with scientists around the world to answer the questions that I'm thinking about. So mm -hmm. um, that is that is a really exciting aspect. Yeah, definitely. Just kind of out of curiosity, because you because you said that you're working in, in governance and international governance. So how are we keeping, you know, that collaboration together to where you know, say certain countries or certain organizations want to, especially because things are a little more privatized today than than what they've been. How are we keeping the balance with that? Like, say, for example, with like the moon, right? We want to establish um, more footholds there. How do you keep things in balance? That's a really good question. Uh, and it's a question that we still don't really know the answer to, <laughs> right? I mean, like, we, the rules are so minimal at this point. Um, mm -hmm. So there, there are international treaties and agreements in play. You know, there's the International Space Treaty, which, or sorry, the Outer Space Treaty, uh, which sets kind of some very basic ground rules uh, in space. Mm -hmm. um, and then there are other international agreements, but countries can choose to sign or not sign them and things like private activity so currently at the international level uh private companies uh they still have to be registered with a country so oh, okay. um when it comes to the outer space treaty or whatever you know they're they're registered with a country and that country is responsible for what they're doing okay so private companies you know they still are 
<laughs> within the country to some yeah. extent. Um, but, you know, we, we didn't account for private space companies in the beginning because they didn't really exist until mm -hmm. relatively recently. So all of these all of these laws and rules are still in their infancy um, and creating international agreements is really, really hard. So maybe that's not even necessarily the like best way to go about it, at least at the beginning. Who knows? These are just questions that, you know, I, I spend a lot of time thinking about uh, in my in my spare time and my volunteer work. So. Oh, yeah, definitely. Because with all the the you know fancy head headlines and stuff of of said country or said you know organization wanting to place footholds on the moon it's very interesting to see how that's going to play out especially with what you're saying with everything's kind of in its in its infancy i mean even the developments of of those um tactics are are in its infancy but it's very very interesting how that's going to that's going to work <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Because um, I, I, I mean, this might not be true. I don't know. Maybe I'll just ask you because uh, I've heard that like China was heavily involved or heavily interested in going to the moon for like mining purposes. There's some form of fuel in which is only not only but like available, like heavily available on the moon compared to what it is on Earth or at least with like you know without having to deal with a bunch of international treaties so something like that is quite yeah, interesting. yeah so yeah so i i'm uh i'm not a moon person but uh, yeah. the moon the moon is essentially i mean the moon is a rock <laughs> the moon doesn't have a whole lot of really interesting stuff that we don't mm -hmm. have on earth um but there are ideas that we could go and use the ice on the moon to create fuel to then be able to go further out into the solar system mm, okay um because it would be easier to launch off of the moon than it would off or to refuel the moon than it would be to just take a bunch of fuel from earth of course yeah um so that that's i that's i think the idea behind that and this is something that the u.s is exploring too right this is not just trying to everybody's thinking about this the u.s oh, yeah. is thinking about this um i mean you know how it goes over resources and throughout throughout human history <laughs> you know that's why i ask <laughs> yeah yeah of course um and it's it's an interesting topic but yeah you know i'm i'm not sure that resources on the moon are necessarily going to be the right way forward but it is certainly something that um we will have to address either way because you know yeah. people want to do it people want to try it yeah for sure i mean there are, there are bunches of resources and things that we could do here on earth that we are exploiting but it's just interests are always on a spectrum they're never you know in a singularity or a binary so i get that but um i know we want to talk about outreach so like how can uh someone engage with the with the overall space community the space world yeah, so I, I mentioned SGAC. I think that that's mm -hmm. one really great organization to get involved for even people who aren't necessarily in the space world right now. There are things like SEDS, which is Students for the Exploration and Development of Space, which is another uh, organization that exists. And then, I mean, going to observatories, mm -hmm. looking at telescopes, looking at planetarium shows, like there are yeah. so many really cool um ways to learn more about it i mean even just like googling for a bit on wikipedia um, <laughs> is always <laughs> is always interesting uh, mm -hmm. and then reach out with questions you know walk up to somebody who spoke at a planetarium show and ask them about what they do i think that that is at, at least in my experience everybody who's working in the space world almost everyone would be happy to answer some questions from somebody who's trying to learn more about it so yeah um i can yeah. attest to that the the visits to the observatories definitely help helps with mm -hmm. funding but also helps people stay curious so that you know mm -hmm. you can make informed decisions on on you know someone said policy <laughs> <laughs> that helps out with okay. the budget <laughs> but mm -hmm. yeah 
uh, it's it's good. Um, it's a it's a wonderful community uh, to to be involved in. So definitely recommend you know if you're watching or listening to 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 get involved. Definitely spike that curiosity. Space is fun. There's so many things to think about. It's the whole universe. You'll never run out of ideas. Yeah, that's <laughs> that's true. <laughs> well, Lindsay, uh, I'm I'm very happy that you were able to join the podcast. And um, I just just want to say thanks a bunch. This has been fun learning about exoplanets, policy, outreach, all the good stuff. Uh, thank you so much. Yeah, happy to do it. Thanks for having me. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Take care.